Go bandha jika pate go pisha go pika kanta rade kanta no mostute. Jayatam surito pango mama menere matera giti matsa vasha param bojo rade no mada no mada. Si man rasa rasa rum be vamsi vera karsam vena shena kanta rade kanta no yes and um. Tibyad brindan on your covered room at a shim at Radna got a shim a shunish to she she rada shilu go vena deva pressure be his save a monash marami. The Mo Brahmani Devaya Go Brahmani Taya Cha Jikari Taya Krishnaya Go Vindaya Namo Namah. Mangalang Bhagavan Vishnu Mangalam Gudirajo Cha Mangalam Panini Kaksho Mangalayatano Hari. Om Naraya Naya Vidmihi Vasadevaya Dimihi Tano Vishnu Pachodi Hatehe Om Mahadevi Chibidmihi Vishnu Pani Chidimihi Tano Lakshmi Pachodi Hatehe Mahalakshmi Namastubyam Namastubyam Sare Sare Hari Pariya Namastubyam Namastubyam Dena Hari Tapti Kanchana Gorengi Rare Vindavani Shuri Vishavana Sute Devi Pranamani Hari Priya Nigamaka Padur Garitam Param Shukamakanamita Javishamita Pibata Bagadam Rasha Mario Mahoda Hishibaganam Krishna Swadam Pagate Damagani Karona Stadi Samasha Padona Koduno Ditam Tom of Piadavishuta Bishatam Bibos him up here in a bit umber of Sinam Prokyahido Hamadam Sanclation of Anamus Santi Nanyataham Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pasaya Putere Shimari Vakti Padan to Shami Tanamanim Stay Sarasati Day Bigodavan Pajani Nirish Jesus and Yodi Praskadadi See Krishna. Tanda Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Abed Gadadha, Shiva Sari Gaur Bhakta Vindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. <coughs> Welcome over the 4th of July holidays, which start on Friday and go right through till Tuesday. We had a record number of visitors on Saturday. At one point, all the tables inside and outside were filled with people who are dining uh, we were busy in the kitchen trying to keep up with everything welcome brent chris castro it's been a while chris thanks for jumping on board they're on facebook john malik and Jean eskelson and we have rob also here with us on zoom we concluded no less than 45 sessions on the story of Marj Ambarish. I hope that I hope that you all got the full picture, the full story. I don't know of any details that we omitted or left out. Some of those more important details we went over uh, more than once repetitively during the course of our 45, 45 minute sessions. So hopefully we've got the example and the character of Marish embedded deep down in our spirit. Now we're going to move to another famous story from the Bhagavatam, which is found in the eighth canto, Namami Mya Taram Gajam Kuta Karanaprabha Grahana Pishendava Piyam Chajam Yami Parambaraya. This is a quote by Gajendra, <clears throat> the king of the elephants. Um, he's been grabbed on the foot by a crocodile, pulled into the water. He'd been bathing in a crystal clear mountain lake with all of his many queens getting stimulated erotically by the rubbing of their bodies one another and by the moisture they were sucking up water and sprinkling on each other and then there was the stimulation the sensual stimulation of rubbing up flanks to flanks leg to leg belly to belly trunk to trunk some of his children were there his little children for whom he had great obvious fondness. Um, he was intoxicated. He'd obtained the sap of certain trees, which have the effect of intoxicating you. He was literally in a maddened state of heightened sense stimulation. In the and he he was the furthest you could be from thinking about God. Diris Titanamoyate repeatedly when we read the descriptions of Krishna conscious people, of pure devotees. This word dira comes up repeatedly. It means sober. It, it, it's the opposite of maddened. It's the opposite of intoxicated. It's one who's very calm, very cool, very collective, who, who doesn't lose one's wits, be, be um, um, taken away by the circumstances, what is it? It says that uh, 
Those who are not fixed in the service of the Lord are like boats on the water, sailboats on the water. They are vulnerable to any breeze. Any breeze will catch the sail and go this way and go this way and go that way. They have no control over their own destiny. They're at the total mercy of the circumstances of any whimsical breeze which happens to come by. And the devotees are fixed in the service of the Lord. Their senses are not unengaged. Their senses are not waiting for some sight or smell or touch to rob them, to hijack them, whisk them away in some random direction. Savai mana krishna parada vasamchi vaikuntabhina. Again, we spent 45 segments on Maharaj Ambarish. Maharaj Ambarish is distinguished by the fact that his mouth was always chanting the glories of the Lord. His hands were sweeping the temple, making flower gardens. His feet were walking back and forth between the temple. <clears throat> With that full, total, ecstatic engagement of the senses in the service of the Lord, there is no danger of the senses being hijacked. And therefore, devotees are always called dira. They're immune to the things that distract ordinary or even extraordinary yogis and ascetics and philosophers. Again, the story of Dervasamuni is very instructive. Even though he's a very accomplished yogi, he was an ascetic. Still, his senses were hijacked by anger at the slightest pretext. Not the case with devotees of the Lord. The Vijendra story starts out as if he were a dyed-in-the-wool non-devotee, a dyed-in-the-wool karmi, and indeed, at the moment prior to the crocodile grabbing his leg in the water, he was the furthest away from God consciousness that you could possibly be, totally sold out to, totally absorbed in sense gratification. <clears throat> we have this uh, uh, description here, it's one verse amongst many verses which describes the sensual stimulation that Gajendra was feeling. And don't forget, not only is he in a beautiful setting, uh, immersed himself, at least from the waist down, in clear, pristine, beautiful, crystal clear water, surrounded by his wives, some of his children, intoxicated, but he himself is also not an ordinary elephant. He's the king of the elephants. He's, he's big like a mountain, muscular. Sometimes it's said the lion is the king of the jungle. That is not the case. The weakest elephant can defeat the strongest lion. Gajendra was the strongest elephant. He was particularly blessed with power and strength and influence. In fact, the description of Gajendra reminds us very much of his description of kings with their many wives and their beautiful circumstances and their intoxicating beverages and their, their sensually oriented lifestyle. As so Gajendra himself was enjoying <clears throat> the full power of the senses, the full power of his shakti, the full power of his strength, the full power of his youth. So from every conceivable sensual, physical, and even mental point of view, he was on top of his game. Well, we find this as one of the many verses which describes the level of his enjoyment. Vighaya tashmin amani tambu nirmalam hemara vindat para renu rishitam paru nikamam nija pushkara jitaram matmanam adibish napanyam gata klamaha. The king of the elephants, again, not an ordinary elephant, but number one, topmost elephant entered the lake, bathed thoroughly and was relieved from his fatigue. Then with the aid of his trunk, he drank the cool, clear nectarine water, which was mixed with the dust of lotus flowers and water lilies until he was fully satisfied. And it goes on and gone. So the description of Gajendra, the animal, it seems very similar to the descriptions that we read about royalty, about the kings of old. And if you look at the Srimad Bhagavatam, you'll see that most of the elaborate stories have to do with the details in the lives of kings. There are many sages 
who are woven into the fabric of the narrative the Srimad Bhagavatam. But rarely is the life of the sage described in minute detail. It's much more likely that the Bhagavatam is going to focus on royalty, on kings. And there's good reason for that when you think about it. You know, everybody respects the sages. Everybody's awed by the sages. But no one wants to be a sage. No one daydreams about living on roots and herbs, doing yoga, wearing only a loincloth in some lonely part of the forest with no children, no wives, no good food, no shelter for yourself. Nobody fantasizes about that. Nobody aspires to that, or at least not many. On the other hand, most people, they read or hear, or see the lives of the kings depicted, and they say, that's for me. I want a little bit more of that in my life. Royalty is what we're attracted by. Royalty is the stuff that screenplays are made out of, popular books are written. People want to know about royalty. What's the king of England doing today? What are the relatives of the king of England up to today? In spite of people saying, oh, we don't need kings. We live in a democratic world. Having a king is an anachronism as time has passed. Still, the tabloids in London, the tabloids in England, they sell more copies than at any other time when the subject matter is gossip about royalties. People are fascinated with the lives of royalty. And so you'll find that most of the stories that go into great detail in the Bhagavatam are about royalty. That's the starting point. If you want to catch the fish, you don't put on the hook the food that you like. You put on the hook the food that people like. The, the beautiful feature of the Bhagavatam is that it gives food for thought for elevated men, for ascetics, for sages, for great saints. There's plenty of material. There's plenty of grist for the mill. There's plenty of uh, nourishment for great saints and sages within the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. But it's also appealing to people in general. It appeals to the great learned men who are a small percentage or a minority. But at the same time, it appeals to the mass of people in general, because there are interests in kings and queens and conspiracies and fights and chivalry. Um, the Bhagavatam picks us up where we're at and takes us from royalty, which is gross, overt sense gratification, to spirituality. If you want to get a tree, trees come from earth, but you cannot get a tree if you want to get a fruit. Fruit comes from a tree. Tree comes from earth. You cannot skip the tree part and get the fruit from the earth. You have to first plant a seed of a tree. You have to water it. You have to weed it. And then only after nurturing and growing the tree can you get the fruit. You can't get the fruit from the earth. The, earth, the fruit comes from the earth, but there are stages in between. So you can't get people from samsara, mired, stuck in the revolution of birth, death, disease, and old age, you cannot benefit them um, by taking them right to the highest spiritual platform, by regaling them with stories about sages sitting in one place, <laughs> meditating on one thing without eating, without sleeping, without sex for, for years and years and years and years. People are not ready for that. And it doesn't make a very compelling narrative. There's not much plot involved in the lives of the saints and sages. So you start from what where pe what people what it is that people aspire for, and hopefully you gradually sublimate their grosser desires. Desire is there, engagement is there, attachment is there. But depending on the quality of your attachment, you're going to achieve liberation, or you're going to be dragged down further amongst the various species of life. 
And what is it about Gajendra that makes him an eligible candidate for appearing in the pages of the big Srimad Bhagavatam? What makes him an eligible candidate is that at some point in the narrative, and we'll get to that, his memory of his previous life revives. When the story opens, he has no recollection of his previous life. He's been totally distracted by sense gratification, by favors, by blessings. Presumably his whole life has been special. He's been groomed as a king. He's living as a king. He's enjoying all the prerogatives of the king. And that has pushed aside any recollection that he's had of his previous life. When you're dreaming at night, you might dream you're a king. You might dream you're surrounded by queens. You might dream you're living in a palace. And that dream is temporary. It's essentially unreal. But you can't convince the dreamer that he's not actually in that position. You cannot convince him that he's not a king. You cannot convince him that he's not in a palace. You cannot convince him that these are not his wives and children. That's the nature of the dream. And while it's happening in the moment, it seems totally real, totally factual to the dreamer. It's only after he wakes up that it all goes away. It all disappears, poof. Um, <clears throat> but similarly, it, it, you, know, you can enjoy sense gratification and at the same time be aware of devotional service or a previous lifetime in which you made advancement in devotional service. So at the time the story opens, Gajendra is totally oblivious of any devotional service he's done in a previous lifetime. He has done devotional service, but he's not remembering. Prapya punyam kritam lokam vishit pasaram suchinam shimacham gehe yoga rashta vijayate tatatam bodhisam yakam labate. In the Bhagavad Gita, sixth chapter, it describes that whatever advancement you make in one life in Krishna consciousness, that remains as a permanent asset. It will never be eroded or atrophy. It will stay there. You may resume materialistic activities. You may cover it over for the time being. But at some time in the future, either in this life or the next life, that level of advancement will revive and one will resume one's devotional service from the point at which one left off. If you've done 2% in one lifetime, and the next time, lifetime, when you intersect with devotees and the holy name and the temple worship, that previous conscience will be revived and you'll start from 3%. Now, having said that, it's not that everyone who did devotional service and then took another birth, not having completed their devotional, remembers that history from birth. Obviously, that's not the case with Gajendra. He's lived quite a few years. Elephants live for a couple hundred years. And who knows, this might have even been in a previous age where living beings' lifespans are much longer. So he's lived at least a third of his life without having stirred up any memory of devotional service performed in a previous life. So it's not that in any every case, someone hits the ground running from a previous life. Um, it is possible to um, have recollection of one's previous life and from the next life, take birth in a family of devotees. And the momentum from a previous life goes on without a hitch, practically speaking, without any interruption. We find those who took birth in families of devotees like Prabhupada, like Maharaj Prikit, and many other examples, they were engaged in devotional service right from the beginning. So where they left off, they literally, without any time lapse or hiatus, they were able to resume devotional service, taking birth in a family of devotees. Um, that's not the case with Gajendra. He did not take birth in a family of devotees. He did not even take birth in a human species. He took birth in an elephant, an animal species, and animal life, animal bodies are permeated with the mode of ignorance. Tamagun, imagine he has a big, huge body full of muscles and fat. It's a, compared to the human body, it's a dull, rather insensitive form that he's been burdened with. The background story is that in his previous life, he was a great king named Induduma. Induduma was a devotee. He'd done a lot of devotional service. 
to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna. In fact, at one time, in his place of residence, Indra was so inwardly turned, he was chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare. So inwardly absorbed that he failed to notice the arrival of a great sage named Nagashtya. Nagashtya was used to being received very elaborately and very respectfully wherever he went. After all, he's a, a huge sage, a huge sage of huge influence, huge powers. And it wasn't that Indra intended any disrespect. It was just that at the moment, he was oblivious of external circumstances. He turned totally inwards in a spiritual trance. And when Agastya Muni saw that Indra Duma had failed to even stand up to receive his guest, he said, well, since you're so dull and since you're so insensitive, I curse you. I curse you to take your next birth in a dull and insensitive body like that of an elephant. That's the backstory of how it was that although he'd been very advanced as a devotee in his previous life, he took his next birth in the body of an elephant. Uh, however, although he's in the body of an elephant, and although he is laboring under the curse of the Muni, and the, and the curse must play out, the curse must have. So according to the material laws of karma, karma is action and reaction, so the seed, you face the deed, whatever you do comes back to you. The law of cause and effect ensures the balance of perfect detecting whatever you do, good and bad, it will resurrect. Death is not the end, it's just a bend. Whatever you've done will come back to you again. So according to the material law of karma, the mistake or the oversight, the disrespect, the inconsideration of Maharaj and Duma's previous life played out in the form of his having taken his next birth as an elephant. So there wasn't anything he could do to that. He lives as an elephant, and the elephant body is, from a natural point of view, antithetical to spiritual life. Very few animals chant Hare Krishna, go to the temple, listen to Bhagavatam class. So basically, the birth that Maharaj Medumna was cursed to take, the situation was not conducive to Krishna consciousness. Here's not a soul who's taking birth in a family of devotees or Brahmins. He's taking family, birth in a family in the mode of ignorance. So the law of karma is going to play itself out. But at the same time, parallel with that, is the principle, even a little advancement in devotional service is a permanent asset. And wherever one left off in a previous life, one will resume. Maybe not in the beginning of the next life, maybe not in the middle, but at some point, there will be the intersection of circumstances which will give one a deja vu, an aha experience. Like, yes, this is what I should be doing. This is where I should be going. This is what life is ultimately all about. But from the beginning of his life, it appeared from a natural point of view, from a karmic point of view, in Madhumna slash Gajendra had everything going against him. There was not the convergence of circumstances to revive his Krishna consciousness from the very beginning of his life uh, throughout all of his adolescence. And here we chance upon him in, uh, in uh, not middle age, but not in youth either. He's obviously the king, um, and, and he would have had to have fought many battles and uh, grown in strength and maturity in order to reach that position as king. So he spent the better part of his life um, in forgetfulness of Krishna consciousness according to the dictates of the law of material nature. But at the same time, latent there is, is the devotional service that he did in a past life, is the disposition, the penchant, the tendency to resume his devotional service to Krishna. It's not going to come out in the natural. He didn't take birth in a family of devotees or Brahmins, so it's not like he hit the ground running. It's more like he hit a brick wall from a karmic point of view. And so in cases like that, it's going to involve a life crisis. In cases like that, it's going to involve coming face to face with unexpected, cruel death that's going to take him to the next level of consciousness. And in fact, if you 
look at the overall theme of the Srimad Bhagavatam. It is how do we react in the face of trying circumstances? How do we respond when life hurts? The driving narrative, the whole 20,000 verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam is how do you respond when life hurts? And there's no bigger hurt, there's no bigger pain in life than death. You're not the body you're living in, your eternal spirit soul. So where shall I begin? Every living entity, including you, is eternal. It's the outer body, which is misty like morning dew, musty and crusty after youth passes, earth to earth, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Every seven years, each cell is replaced. The old body is erased, displaced, effaced. Every cell is changing. You're always reincarnating. The question remains, what are you going to do to overcome reincarnation and save yourself from material contamination? You can ignore the concept by hitting the exit by the nearest route, or you can stay and listen to our lyrics and get a vision of the truth. Does your life have meaning, or are you just trying to escape, or are you just breathing and taking up space? <clears throat> we have the outer body, which is misty like morning dew, and then we have the inner body, which is eternal. So the, the question is, how do we respond in the face of death? If you know nothing other than the outer body, death is going to be the worst moment of your life. You will have lived your entire life in denial of death. Because whatever you've worked for, family, dynasty, influence, money, it will all be dissolved at the time of death. Most people live their whole lives in total denial of death. We, 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 the most important fact is that these bodies are temporary, that we are fallible. We are not, the soul is infallible. In the spiritual world, all the infallible souls have infallible bodies, and therefore they're eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. They're liberated from the limitations and conditions of material life. But in the material world, the infallible living beings have fallible bodies. Now, not wanting to face that fact or to come into terms with it or solve the problem of an infallible soul being in a fallible body, wanting to avoid the issue, says they surround themselves with other fallible soldiers, like the wife, the older child, the middle child, the younger child, the cousins, the uncles, the aunts, the business associates, the country with its national guard and its active military service people. Some or other we think that although we are infallible, although we are fallible, <clears throat> our bodies are fallible, some or other by surrounding these fallible bodies with other fallible bodies, some or other death won't get through. Some or other death will be confused by our retinue, by our entourage. However, that's just denial. That's just living your life in illusion. I remember one time, Bai Bobby and I were at a truck stop somewhere, and uh, I, I was just looking out over the parking lot, and as I did, this semi-trailer was coming to a stop. You hear the, the brakes activating and the, psh, the air pressure releasing, and then the car being put into park. And from the cab came this family of four, and they were all dressed exactly the same. And they all disembarked from the cab and they, they were lined up four abreast and they're walking towards the convenience store. It looked like something out of Seven Samurai, something. They, they were all wearing cowboy hat. They were all wearing the same kinds of boots. They were all wearing jeans. They were all wearing a big belt buckle, which had the same emblem on them. And they were wearing stars and stripes shirts. Their shirts were red, white, and blue with stars and stripes on them. And they were all walking abreast towards it. And, and there, there had to be some sort of a theme song running through their brains, you know, that wherever they went, they, they were confident. 
they were cocky, thinking that they had each other's backs, that some or other death would not approach them because they were all dressed the same, because they had the same strut, the same walk, because they had the same soundtrack playing in their brains, uh, because they had the same last name. They had the same occupation driving a truck. It's some or other, because of their um, cohesiveness, that death would not pull them apart. There's a verse in the 10th canto. Naikatra priya shambhasha suridam sarvadaram dehinam plavanam sotishoyara. People think that because they're surrounded by friends and relatives and well-wishers, that there isn't anything that will pry them apart. It just seems so right, so pat, so comfortable, so, so the way it should be. Um, that we can't imagine that it's all going to be torn asunder by the influence of time and karma. We cannot remain together. Uh, we try to cling to each other. We try to create as solid and lasting and enduring bonds as we can between husband and wife and children and uncles and aunts and relatives. But the force of time is so indomitable, was so strong that we cannot, with all of our willpower and with all of our wishful thinking, we cannot keep the family members together, the countrymen together. We cannot maintain the status quo. It is said that in the course of floating down a turbulent river, sometimes sticks and pieces of brush and debris will, will come together. And they'll, they'll kind of, they may have little branches and all, which kind of entangle themselves. And so they'll, br different branches from different trees and all will create a little bit of a log jam and they'll cling together and they'll float for some time down the river. But the first time they come to white water or a, a heightened degree of turbulence, and that will, that will disrupt, disrupt their cohesiveness and then they'll all go shooting one way or another. This verse says that even as much as you surround yourself with friends and well-wishers and relatives and aunts and uncles and so on and so on, the, the force of time, the, the tide, the current is so swift that we're all being washed away. And although that's, that force of time will bring us together occasionally uh, under the banner of family, friends, and country for some time, Eventually, that same force which brought us together will again disrupt us, uh, break us apart, and send in us all in different directions. <clears throat> so in spite of our fondest hopes, we cannot maintain any secure, fixed position within this material world. Eventually, death is going to come and tap you on the shoulder. And so the main question which most people totally deny. Most people are not open. They do not want to know. The question I propose from me to you is, do you have the eyes to see? The soul is unborn. It never grows old. You can tell by the way that we cry, trying to conform to a limited life. <clears throat> the soul is eternal. Death is so painful because we're not supposed to die. The soul is eternal. We know it inside. Like, why should I change my body again? Most people are not open. They do not want to know. So for those who are seriously inquisitive about the meaning of life, Atato Brahma Janash and Srimad Bhagavatam is there. Srimad Bhagavatam opens with this question by the king, Maharaj Pariksit, to the sage, Shukadeva Goswami. Tatasya va pram imam vichete vishabhi vipari tukit saravatmanam yanashiram sutta tatatsam tatya vyaktaham. To the sage, the Maharaj Pariket, who's been unfairly cursed to die, to leave his body by the bite of a snake bird within seven days, he asks the great sage Sukadeva Goswami for the benefit of all living beings. Pritam means what, what are we supposed to do normally on a normal day? Actually, there is no such thing as a normal day. We could die at any time. 
Death is like a black snake that hovers over the mouse. The mouse is going about his business, oblivious of the fact that there's a snake just over his shoulder. And at the whim of the snake, whenever the snake feels like it, he's going to gobble up the mouse. It doesn't matter how busy the mouse is or how important an affair the mouse is tending to at any given moment. The time of departure of the is not determined by the mouse, by his busyness, by his importance in mouse society, by whether he goes right or left. The time of departure of the mouse, the time of that's designated, ordained for the mouse leaves is determined by the snake and not the mouse. Considering that, there is no such thing as a normal day. Any day could be my last, especially in this modern age. Prophet used to say all the advances of technology and science, the sum total, the sum total effect of all advancement of science and technology is that death is much closer to us than it used to be. Previously, without cars going 80 miles an hour on the freeway, without weapons of mass destruction, without nuclear bombs, without uh, germs, viruses which have been cultivated in the laboratory, staph infections which have grown stronger and stronger, learned how to overcome each progressive um, antibiotic. The, the overall result is that death comes much closer. Someone says, well, true, you know, in the old days, there was a high infant mortality rate. We don't have as high an infant mortality rate as we do. That's true. We have less children who die in the first year of their life. But the, but the interesting thing was that if you survived in the old days, if you and this is not necessarily true about ancient India, because India knew about the germ, they knew about antiseptics, they knew about how to live a hygienic life. And so infant mortality was not a feature of traditional ancient India. It might have been of modern India, which has forgotten a lot of its tradition and culture, but it was not a, a something which could be described in terms of ancient Indian culture. But even if for argument's sake, you say there's infant mortality in the pre pre-modern age, if you did survive the first year of life, then you would live towards to 100 degrees and you would be healthy, you would have a strong immune system. Um, in, uh, in India, traditionally, uh, uh, men and women would be working vigorously in the fields up to their 100th, 105th, 110th year and not um, proceed death with a year or two years or five years or 10 years of invalidity, but they would be healthy and they would just drop dead all of a sudden. I remember when my mother was in a, <clears throat> a home in Pennsylvania, she was 82. And there was one lady, when I would visit my mother, there was, there was another lady down the hall. It, 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 I think she did it all, I think she did it 24 hours. She'd be going, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. After a while, you didn't even notice it anymore. But um, it was always going on. It was kind of the ambience. This lady, ah, ah, ah. So I once asked about her, and I was told she was 93 years old. And I said, uh, when, what, at what age did she enter the nursing home? When she was 70. She'd been there for 23 years. No wonder she was freaked out. No wonder she was saying, ah, ah, ah. Well, that was not the case in the old times. If you, if you survived the first year of life, you had an ironclad immune system. Uh, there were no cars to run you over. There were no diseases that could touch you. There were no terrorists. There were no criminals. There were no robbers. There were no muggers. You, you would live a happy, high quality, meaningful fulfilling life for at least a hundred years it's not now it's so uncommon to live a hundred years that hardly you'll find anyone over the age of even 90 and yet hardly anyone um, lived less than 100 years in in the past ages <clears throat> so in any case the Srimad Bhagavatam brings us face to face with the most important topic that we have to deal with, especially with the facilities that we have in this human term of life. And it you might think it's morbid 
that most of the stories in the Srimad Bhagavatam describe the theme of death, uh, people facing death. And they face death for various reasons. Prahlad faced death because his father was an atheist and Prahlad was a devotee and his father was envious of him. Vritasura faced death, kind of like Gajendra, he'd taken birth in a uh, inauspicious species of life, a species of life that um, did not gravitate towards devotional service. Uh, Vritasura is facing death. Um, Pritu Maharaj is facing death. Practically all the major figures of the Srimad Bhagavatam are showing us by example how to respond when life hurts, how to respond when the greatest, most incomprehensible hurt of all looms. It is the specter of death. What is the duty of men in all circumstances, especially of those who are about to die? That's the question posed by the dying King Parikshit to the sage Sukadeva Goswami. And the answer is given in so many different ways and shapes and forms so we can fully understand our position in this material world, fully understand the extent to which we are trapped in birth, death, disease, and old age. And at the same time, the full light, the full direction, the full guidance to extricate ourselves from birth, death, disease, and old age is also laid out. And all we have to do to make our lives successful is Mahajana Yenigata, is following the footsteps of these great devotees who faced life's hurts with the inner strength, fortitude, the foundation of Krishna consciousness, and very soberly, and with full illuminated, joyful consciousness, navigated the great pitfall called death and went back to home, back to God. That's our opening segment on the story of Gajendra, the elephant who ended up going back to home, back to God, even though the beginning of his life was not from a material, natural, karmic point of view, all that promising, all that auspicious. So thanks for joining us, Brent. Spencer, Chris Castro, shout out to Chris. For so many years, Chris was here for over a year as a volunteer. John Malik, Jean, never missed a session, I don't believe. By Bobby, she puts elephant emojis in her Facebook comments. Good job. Divya Josie, he gives us a hearty, hearty Krishna. There's some stars and likes and thumbs up from John Malik and others. Please go ahead and do that. Push us up in terms of the Facebook algorithms. And Chris says, I day daydream about it. Maybe in my next life or when my son is old enough to walk his path of knowledge and wisdom. I do miss temple life. <clears throat> Made the common material life make so much more sense. It's really an illusion, but I'm staying strong, soul versus mind. <clears throat> maybe I'll live a temple again one day, maybe next lifetime, or when my soul to son is old enough. And then another comment says, smile and keep marching. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, those are the extent of our comments here. And... Uh, Rob, yeah, we had a couple of nice young visitors to our Sunday feast last night. One was Max from Ogden, and the other was Sam from Salt Lake City. They appeared to have been friends. They both had bead bags and tea lock. And Sam said that he had had a conversation with you last night at the temple service in Salt Lake City. Do you remember that, Rob? Let's see. Is this down? Yes, probably do. So what was he curious about? Did he ask some good questions? Uh, I didn't get to speak with him uh, in much depth, but I know Govinda. Uh, oh, yeah. Govinda yeah. Dave got too. It's interesting because um, he remembered both of your names. He he said, uh, he, I, I, I was talking about resources, people that he could connect with in Salt Lake. Because as soon as I heard about him being from Salt Lake, then I said, oh, we have their Saturday night program. And, uh, you know, you could talk to Rob there. You could talk to Sundari Priya. 
And he said, yeah, I talked to Rob and Govinda Dave last night. So he he had your names, both of your names, right there on the tip of his tongue. You must have made a deep impression on him. <clears throat> yes, I, I was tied up with my son and the and the service responsibilities there at the table or at the temple. So I wasn't able to sit down and chat with him very much. Um, I tried to at the end, but um, it was the tail end of things. But yes, definitely a seeker and uh, look forward to more of his association. And it also makes a point that, um, you know, people, people think people think, well, I have to sit down and spend two hours with someone. If I don't have two hours, then I'll pretend I don't see him and ignore him because I've got something else to do. You know, these are two extremes. You know, oftentimes it just takes a smile and a word of welcome. You know, you might have your son, you might have other things to do. Lord knows in Spanish Fork, I've always always got 10 or 20 things to do. But and, and I realize I don't have a lot of time to spend with visitors, but I always smile. I always ask, where are you from? I ask, what brings you to Utah? Have you seen the animals? Is the food good? You know, I always, you know, I may not have a lot of time. I may have other demands on my time, but it doesn't necessarily take much, you know. It, a lot of devotees, you know, they think, well, I'm too busy to even smile at someone. I'm too busy to welcome them. I'm too busy to make them feel at home. I'm too busy to make them feel like we're happy that you came. That is such wrong thinking. You're shooting yourself in the foot. Um, why open a big temple? Why have all this? Uh, if, you can't, if you can't be happy when people come, that's the whole purpose. That's why we do all that we do. You know, as an alternative, going out in the parking lot and going out of the airport and buttonholing people and giving them books, people are walking through the door and you don't care to smile at them because you're too busy. You don't care to say a good welcoming word to them. I, I can't, I don't know. I don't know what people are thinking, you know. So I'm, so you, all you did illustrated my point. You know, you're, you're showing that what I'm saying is true. You're, you're, you're in your humility, you're saying you didn't have much time, you had your son, you had all these other things, but you took the time, you took a moment to smile and to say a few words to someone. You could have, would have, should have done more, but, but you did the essential. And that, and I can tell you that made such a favorable impression on him that he remembered both your name and Govinda Dave's name. And so bottom line is, you know, whatever you're doing, no matter how harassed or harried you feel you might be, take a moment to smile and well, make people welcome. Krishna is within the heart. They arrive at the door of the temple, not ordinarily. It is Krishna who has brought them to the door. And you have a duty as a servant of Krishna to make them feel welcome to let them know that you're happy that your Lord has brought their footsteps into your presence. So anyway, I, I, just, I just wanted to comment on, on your comments. And Rob incidentally is a greeter too. So he stands at the door and he gives everyone a smile. He opens and closes the door for people, which is essential. You know, every temple needs a greeter. If Walmart has greeters, and we should at least have our own greeters also. <laughs> Is that okay? Hey, you're too kind. You've been, you've been an excellent example. Thank you, Prabhuji. <laughs> okay. Do, what, what can you share with us in terms of your uh, insights and your sayings from today? Uh, I only got a couple. It's been a busy morning with, uh, with my son, but uh, hopefully... They're adequate. So calm, cool, and collected keeps one unaffected. Mm -hmm. And this dream is a temporary thing. Okay, I'll use them. I'll use them. I could almost remember them, but not quite. So please go ahead, do and send them through Facebook. How are you doing, Cal? Can you hear me, Cal? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Keep the faith, man. Hare Krishna. All right. Hare Krishna. That's it. Uh, we're starting a whole new series. 
on Gajendra the elephant. We'll try to present the story of Gajendra from all different angles and points of view so that we can derive the full measure of benefit and enrichment from the story of this king who took his next birth as an elephant, initially in total forgetfulness of Krishna, but as fate would have it, he revives his Krishna consciousness during a moment of crisis. More tomorrow and the next day, and even, I predict, in the following week. Thanks for being with us. Till next time, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.